big countdown. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have to figure out what we're going to talk about. Well, now we need to have, like, have some kind of intelligent conversation that could be <laughs> construed as a potentially really interesting cold open. Mm, so this the uh, Bible system model, yes. The <laughs> system two, I think. Uh, it's not present in capitalism, perhaps. Mm. I was I was thinking about that episode on the uh, People's Republic, actually, because there's a bit right at the end of this when he's talking about a paradox, like Jevons' paradox or something. Yeah. Have yeah. we come across that before somewhere? You know, I meant to look it up. So yeah, I well, it, me too. I, never did. I think I maybe, <laughs> I think maybe when Mom explained what it was, I was like doing a bit of skim reading at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I think he just bought it up and then expected us to know. As to know Although I was also skim reading, if you can't tell, so maybe he did explain it. <laughs> oh well, uh, that was our opportunity. Things. That was our opportunity to like show our knowledge, and we've. Been... <laughs> well, Dan, actually, of course, I remember what it is. It's an <laughs> increase in efficiency in the resource use uh, will generate an increase in resource consumption rather than a decrease. We have come across that before. Uh-huh. I forget exactly where. It sounds like something in the in some kind of ecological reading we've done, actually. Mm-hmm. But maybe so it might be there. the exact same use of exact same context as it appears here. Anyway. <laughs> That was well recited of you, Jack. You clearly have a very encyclopedic memory. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> your, yeah. Your skills of recall very are very literal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Well, Dan, today, uh, if estimates are correct, about half a million people are on strike in the United Kingdom. That's pretty insane. Yeah, I didn't know it was that big. I was aware that there were strikes today, mostly only by virtue of the fact that there seemed to be a lot of school children around in town. And I was like, what are all these kids doing here? It's not the, I was like, no, actually, I was like, shit, is it the weekend? No. <laughs> kids uh, are on strike. So, yeah, this, there were school strikes. And um, as I was telling you earlier, I was rudely interrupted by some students and teachers having a teaching. So, um, yeah, everybody should just go back to school and go back yeah. to work. Stop That's interrupting a, yeah. my life. Well, tell you what, Dan, I'm also, I've also got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about these workers getting a bit uppity, and I'll tell you why. It's because all of these people are on strike. Every single union is on strike, except for my union. <laughs> deal with that. I still got to go to work. And like the other union at the place that I work, they're all on strike. I'm not no. on strike. I'm just like, yeah, I got to like, you know, I mean, go you in could between just, the picket lines. You could, you could join that union, Jack. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dan. That's a really, yeah. Okay. Great idea. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that one before. <laughs> uh, what are you going to do? Um, yeah, no. Neither of us are on strike today. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. Hopefully soon. Uh, I, guess my, that dip- yeah, go on. Well, I was going to say my union failed spectacularly uh, last year for these strike dates to get the ballot. So it's kind of my own fault, I guess. Although, mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not such as life. Next time next time yeah. so who else was on strike today do you know uh, a lot of bus drivers in london were train drivers in two different unions were i know the teachers unions i don't really know the way the teachers unions operate it's the neu right but then there's also like are there sub unions for scotland and england i'm not really certain i don't know there used to be several teachers unions there also used to be a union for head teachers that was separate mm. from uh, really the regular teachers <laughs> labor aristocrats <huh>? yeah. <laughs> um and some, some, I think some college lecturers fall under different unions. Oh yeah, I yeah, UCU's like on strike like, as well. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, but beyond that, I have no idea. Hmm. It's interesting. I tell you what, every single union out here seems to just be falling into the exact same trap. And I'd like to know more about why this is. We've talked about this before of just like going to various managements and being like, we will be on strike this day. A day and two weeks from now, three days after that, and then we'll be going back to work. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I get that, you know, it would be very difficult to organize a strike where you tell people you will not be going back to work until we get what we want. That's probably why they don't do it, because, you know, fighting funds aren't what they used to be, I guess, or maybe they just never were. But yeah, it seems like the Tories now... And maybe if a Keir Starmer Labour government were to get into power and this kind of thing were to keep going, it seems like they just budget it in. They just budget in the strike days and they go, OK, things are going to kind of shut down on this day, that day and that day. You you know, they say to the bourgeoisie of various sectors, you're going to lose some money. But this is just what we have to do. We have to discipline labor and we can't let it really go anywhere and we can't give it an inch. And they just, you know, they just write that into their little accounting books. And that's just the way it is. So hopefully these strikes go somewhere, but it doesn't feel like a lot of them are. Yeah, it's, you never you never get the indefinite strike, do you? Mm. Nobody just goes on strike and says we're not going back to work until our demands are met. I do that, <laughs> but instead of just not showing up to work, I go to work and just don't work. <laughs> I'd be doing that even if things were fine. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
So Jack was on strike today. What he was actually doing was reading <laughs> Capital at work. Yeah, exactly. I was on. I was on a sympathy strike, which don't tell anybody. It's illegal. So yeah, oh, I yeah. still got paid. <laughs> don't tell anybody. <laughs> I, you know what's funny, though, is more and more people are opening up to, like, the power of labor, obviously, just in a very, like, concrete, like, ideological kind of way. Because I was just speaking with someone and they were like, um, did you know that it's illegal to have a sympathy strike? And I was like, yeah, that's illegal, like, everywhere. Because if they if that was legal to do, it would be bad for the bourgeoisie. But they're like, did you know about this? And it's funny because, I don't know, this is a person I don't think would have necessarily, I don't know maybe had this interest in labor had, you know, obviously I'm saying obvious things had the, you know, dynamic of capitalism not been heating up as it is, as it has been this winter, but that's, that's heartening to see. So maybe that'll go somewhere. Yeah. This sounds like somebody who was thinking, hmm, all these people are on strike. Maybe I should be on strike. <laughs> How yeah. do I go about doing that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. And yeah. the touch is life. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really have anything else to report. Um, Oh, I tell you what, Dan, here's something to report. I finished two books other than Fossil Capital since we last spoke. No, one of them was extremely important my, to, to my development uh, as a human being, and the other one, maybe not so much. The first one was Karl Marx's Capital. <laughs> oh, my. <okay. laughs> the first volume, which I did actually finish, which, wow, would have worked. But the more important work, Dan, was Graham McNeil's A Thousand Sons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's where I thought that was going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all I got to say about by that. Black Library. Yeah. yeah. Space Wolves, kind of pieces of shit. That's all I got to say. Just not yeah, yeah, yeah. Although maybe you should read the the one from their perspective. And <laughs> exactly. How you feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, oh, the thousand suns, oh, the fast ones. Oh uh, man. But for now, I am mourning Prospero, Dan, and mm, I've been thinking sad, a lot about very that sad, very sad. and primitive accumulation. That's a, that's been basically my two weeks. So. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And then today, just like fuck, I have to read. 100 pages of fossil capital <laughs> yeah that's been the past two days of my life has just been consuming as much fossil capital as i can um, and leaving little room for anything else but i've actually really enjoyed it i just mm. i basically just finished it and then came to record this with you um Good. and uh yeah i'm a bit fired up he gets a bit heated he gets mm. a bit i don't know yeah yeah you could I was you, waiting could, you could feel the kind of like um j just utter disgust and like <laughs> horror despair mm. um just spewing into these pages and uh yeah. it's invigorating to read if not incredibly desperate at the same time it is yeah i was feeling very depressed these last two days i was just like oh fuck god damn it and he does an interesting thing when he starts talking about what it is that we can do and more so just starts talking about the present day where he's like a lot of people will say this and then he'll put forward the argument and you don't really know what he thinks about it and you're kind of like oh is putting massive amounts of uh, sulfates into the atmosphere to like block solar radiation a good idea? Maybe it is a good idea. And then you flip the page and he's like, this is the stupidest shit I've ever heard. <laughs> we need to bring it all down. And it's like, all right, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely heard him talk favorably about like um, a sort of war communism version <laughs> of economic organization that would be able to um, decarbonize the economy fast enough to save us from apocalypse but um i think that phrase gets mentioned once after a long quote from trotsky in this book and then doesn't really get taken up again um yeah i think i read at the back of this book it seems like this was adapted from his phd uh, thesis so maybe mm -hmm. maybe that's why there was a chapter in here that was called something like fossil capital where you were kind of like okay this was clearly just the article that this whole thing was based off over of, the paper it felt like he was repeating himself quite a bit um, could it maybe just read that? Of reading <laughs> Somebody should have told us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody should have told us we just need to just skip to the chapter that was all about Robert Brenner and Ellen Meeks' work <laughs> and then read the follow chapter that was all about Capital and then uh, then skip to the end. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We should just read book reviews for this show from now on. We'll be like, yeah. we read a book review and monthly review of Fossil Capital. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or like Google, like Amazon book reviews or something. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, well, okay. It would Dan. be easier. It would be considerably easier. It would be considerably easier. And that is unfortunately what we're all about. I would like to begin this conversation about fossil capital, Dan. Uh, we should say the second part. Um, we read 9 through 16, I think chapters 9 through 16. Um, I'd like to begin this with uh, a little story then that he, he gets to in this book. And it's a story that begins in the syphilitic uh uh borough of holborn in london 
And I hope oh, I hope you can figure out where I'm going with this. And it's in 1824, and he tells a story about how a bunch of sicko bourgeoisie, the leading capitalists of the day, got together to kind of like steal themselves. This was in the midst of a big structural crisis. They needed to figure out how to discipline labor, and they came across they came upon the uh, technology of the steam engine and they went, here we go, baby, we're going to do the fossil economy and we're going to uh, discipline labor and it's going to be awesome. And the way that they chose to consecrate this new ideology around steam and steam power was through putting up a statue of James Watt, right? Of the steam engine guy. And um, he talks all about, he has a sentence in here that's something like, um, one of the many functions of ideology can be to unify a class, close its ranks, and weld it to a force fit for social combat, confident of a high calling and probable victory. I think that rocks. That's really, really cool. It's not so cool when they're talking about the bourgeoisie, uh, talking about basically like we're going to explicitly uh, discipline labor <clears throat> and, you know, kick off another accumulation uh, cycle. But the thing that I wanted to mention, Dan, that makes this so disgusting and so evil is that, do you remember where they where they had this meeting in Holborn, where they did this? Do you remember what building? Oh, wasn't it like the Freemasons Hall? Or something? <laughs> it was the fucking Freemasons Hall. It's like, how much more evil could they have been in consecrating this new ideology? He was like, oh my God. When I read that, I was like, it was in a Freemasons Hall. I'm not like a Freemasons guy. Like, I don't believe in conspiracy theories around Freemasons, but it's just like the fact that that's where they met, it's like, come on. It's like, and then they shed their human skin and, you know, flitted their lizard lips. Like, they decided to erect a massive gold statue to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to Mammon. I mean, this James is the Watt. solution. Yeah, to Mammon. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is the solution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God, I was. I was. All jokes aside, though, I was fascinated by how explicit this was because you're like for this first bit, I was like, okay, how intentional was this shift in productive relations? Like, it seems to just be more so than the bourgeoisie trying to discipline labor. It seemed to just be much more like here is a way to up labor productivity but a bing, but a boom. And those two things do go hand in hand, right? Especially when there's like a massive leap from the productive forces as there was from water to steam, but it was explicit. And he, in this chapter, um, just talks about how explicit the worship of steam power was amongst the ruling classes and how the like fear and hatred and loathing of steam was amongst the, you know, disgusting, unwashed working masses. It's interesting. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? That, yeah, you're right. The first half of this book, and I suppose this is a general like, a contradiction you get sometimes where sometimes you have to look at these things as being abstract forces and laws and tendencies and then sometimes you just have to find the agents and ask what they are actually thinking and doing and then as you say the first two chapters that started the section that we read were one on steam fetishism by the bourgeoisie and as you say they were sort of like they knew um exactly why they were pursuing this one line of development want this one form of uh, power generation over water even the, even the those people who he cited in the first half of this book as being big advocates of the water wheel and remaining uh with that form of power generation um all still fall in line with this kind of um fetishism as he calls it of steam um and also he's he's very keen to point and as we get toward the end of this this section of the book it sort of becomes apparent why when we got onto discussions of how he feels about the idea of the Anthropocene um, and how much he's opposed to that idea, um, a lot of that sort of like line of argument is set up in the second chapter, which we read today, around how much revulsion and opposition there was to the introduction of steam engines into the factories and this idea of around sort of discussion around demonology, um, but also how it <laughs> resulted in uh very deliberate directed action by the workers by the proletarians against this new form of technology um mm. particularly in the general strike of 18, uh, 1848 which i didn't know or 42 rather which i didn't 42, know a huge amount yeah. about until i read this yeah um, what's well, interesting because the way that we're taught about that is very much like well in america you're it's mentioned very briefly it's like oh yeah and there were these people called the luddites and they just hated technology fools right i don't know how do you learn about the Luddites here or that general movement? I mean, you don't really at all. But obviously, yeah, we do have this understanding, the sort of like 
the colloquialism Luddite in language does mean something, right? It means somebody who's just generally opposed to technology in a kind of like backwards thinking way. Um, and we should much rather see the Luddites or the sort of like uh, plug pullers, as he calls them in this, um, <laughs> or the people who go around smashing steam engines um, in the general strike. We're very di- directly striking out against um, something that was like materially detrimental to uh, their quality of life and the quality of life at work, but also something thoroughly modern as well. It was a thoroughly modern reaction. It wasn't a, a backwardness, I don't think. Yeah, I and mean, he kind of ties this into kind of like the failings of Chartism too, right? Because he's like Chartism was at its peak right around this time, right? And he's saying that kind of because Chartism had as its main goal these laudable goals, but not end goals, right, of universal suffrage and things like that. Like nothing inherently revolutionary is in like creating revolution to a new mode. It's not about like social relations. It's not about anything like this. It is just about like, well, if all of us can vote, then we'll just vote our people in and it'll all be fine, right? Which, yeah, that's been shown to not be the case. Um, but of course, this still universal suffrage was something that the ruling classes were very worried about. And he kind of ties this into like, in, in an interesting way, he's almost talking about how these revolts weren't necessarily against steam power itself, but were about crappy living conditions. And because the kind of general conception of these people is that they, as you're saying, just wanted to like stop the tide of history and stop the productive forces. And they just wanted to turn back time. And you can't do that. You can't stop it. But it seems to imply that if instead of Chartism, there was a ideology surrounding it or a political program of that was like directed at the social relations and not the machines and not necessarily just suffrage and living standards, that things would have turned out very differently because as reading, you know, primary documents that he cites, like there was a real fear of actual revolution. I mean, these people were just going down, burning down factories, which rocks. Yeah, 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 yeah. They should have marched on London. That's what they should have done. Should have done. <laughs> Indeed. Shame. That's another thing, though, that's interesting is he talks about how he does get into the question. One of the things that I didn't, that I thought was missing from the first half of this book was a discussion of how steam power went into other industries other than just the textile industry. And he said that it grew really regionally, which I thought was interesting. Steam power shifting to different industries didn't necessarily grow industry to industry. It grew completely regionally. So up north, steam power was being used um, a lot earlier in a bunch of different types of things, obviously first in the textile industry, and then eventually it spread to London. Um, yeah. It's probably you don't learn more about this stuff being from a hotbed of revolutionary activity such as yourself. Yeah. It's, uh, I think the, yeah, it's a shame. We, yeah, I don't, um, yeah, we don't study a lot of that history. Or I suppose we do, but what we get is the kind of like, I suppose the Industrial Revolution is this kind of like celebrated technological leap, I suppose. And then also to some extent, oh, how wretched it was and how poorly treated people were. And there were sort of uh, children working in the mills and that kind of thing. But then there was this progressive process of overcoming that. I suppose that's the narrative that we're all exposed to, right? It's the Industrial Revolution was sort of like horrible, but we've gotten past that now. kind of thing. Yeah, we don't see um, it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, <exactly. laughs> well that's the that i mean that's the general point that he's making throughout this isn't it it's just like no the history of capitalism has always been horrible um and there is one uh and if there's one sort of like continuity to be drawn through it it's the con- the conflict between capital and labor and um how capital always responds to labor by as we've said before, like disciplining it or take bringing in sort of like technological fixes to overcome um, labor's resistance to its, um, as you said last week, it's uh, uh, real su- subsumption. No, f- formal subsumption? Which one do I want? Formal subsumption is the first it's, one. It's real <laughs> subsumption of the technology, right? Um, but the point that he's adding into this mix is always that Every time that capital um, has to take some action to overcome labor, there is always, in his view anyway, some kind of environmental impact as well. Quite often what come along comes along with um, these various fixes that capital chooses to um, make production cheaper and easier and more profitable and to expand surplus value also come along with um, an increase in fossil fuel production 
and the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and he sort of, the first half of this book is one extended case study in the adoption of steam by the cotton industry. Uh, but the sort of second half of this book is sort of an expansion of that principle as a sort of theoretical idea more broadly to the history of capitalism to say whenever it is that capital needs to overcome labor, there is this uh, detrimental ecological consequence. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, I guess we'll talk a bit more about maybe comparing this to the Jason Moore, I guess, a bit at the end once we kind of talk about everything. But throughout all of this, I was kind of like, but it's capitalism is just kind of a way of organizing nature, isn't it? Like if we take for granted that um, labor power is a use value that it itself also comes from nature, um, or at least people's ability or not ability to labor, but them laboring. So I don't know. I was kind of thinking about like, because he does have a long bit in him where he's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, like the relations, the productive forces, uh, human and extra human natures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, but it, it does feel a bit like they're all co-determinant. But the thing that is the most determinant, and this is a cop out, is the social relations, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of that, Dan, should we get into the um, Ellen Meeksons Wood stuff? I was surprised to to see her and Brenner come up. I don't know if I should have been or not, but I was like, oh, they're back. <laughs> Yeah, I almost feel like um, we did quite a good job of predicting a lot of what was going to come in this book. Obviously, <laughs> we, were, we were reading the first half of it and extrapolating. Um, but as you say, yeah, it was quite pleasing to see how heavily he draws on uh, Brenner and Woods and sort of Brenner's thesis of the transition to capitalism and how much he draws from that uh, to then explain people's misunderstandings around the transition from um, other forms of energy production to the burning of fossil fuels. Um, what did you think of that analogy? I guess it was, it was um, in my mind, primarily predicated on the sort of idea that um, an ex because that ex and a sort of ex extended criticism of uh, this sort of like sort of Malthusian analysis, um, which was kind of saying that there was this, this process of overcoming some deficiency in nature. There was a deficiency in nature. There was a shortage of access to water, say, or in the specific case of this energy shift, there was a lack, there was an inability to extract enough energy from water. So they had to move over to steam more broadly in that analysis. Technology, adva technological advance happens when um, human beings come up against some kind of limit and have to find another way around it, um, which he is sort of like, making an analogy to Brenner's criticism of the sort of neo-Smithian analysis of how we got into capitalism, right? It's a similar kind of thing of um, human beings just needed to overcome some other impediments to then uh, excel in what they were always predestined to do, which is truck barter and exchange and capitalism sort of the natural advent of that. Um, and he's sort of like criticizing people who make that kind of argument when it comes to understanding fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, that's just a criticism that I feel like everybody should take under their wing of like, when you're studying history, you can't use hindsight bias and be like, oh, well, this thing happened, because it's just another form, right, of like, this thing happened, so it was always going to happen. It's like, okay, well, that's teleological and just wrong. For all the people who <clears throat> um, criticize Marxism as being teleological, this vein of thought is like the most teleological thing on the planet. But it's also infused with like a kind of much more sinister aspect to it too, this kind of Malthusian um, influence on Ricardo and um, all of those schmucks, which I thought was really interesting and I'd never really thought about before. And just because I think this is important, I'm just going to read a couple sentences where he says, for the Malthusians, uh, the trans historical factor is the biological urge to breed shared not only by all societies, but by all animal populations. That's like, if your politics uses the phrase, the biological urge to breed, <laughs> or just the word breed at all in reference to humans, there's some evil stuff going on there. So he continues, Britain deviated from all these other countries skipping a bit, not only because it developed some novel system or peculiar disposition, or not because it developed some novel system or peculiar disposition, but because it broke through the constraints that had previously limited everyone's horizons, um, doing what all humanity had only vainly dreamed of. 
And then he goes on to talk about how he says this brand of analysis has not, of course, emerged in a theoretical vacuum, impregnated with the classical bourgeois economics, uh, another bad phrase. It simply brings the trinity of Ricardo, Malthus, and Smith to bear on energy, blah, 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 blah. Um, this is why, you know, people like Ellen Meekson's Wood and Robert Brenner um, have applied a very similar critique of all of this to, you know, Ricardo, Smith, and all of these different people, because there is in this thinking fossil energy and the ability to use fossil energy like we do now was like a latent thing, right? It was something that was always around and people had always wanted to do. They always wanted to use, you know, coal in the ways, in the ways the capitalists do now. Um, but that just, just on a basic level, it's like people were using coal before this. So it's like, how can you explain that massive jump in coal usage in, in the massive injection of it into industry that happened just like that, right? Because people were always using it to heat their homes and all of this different stuff, but it wasn't until, and Mom's explanation for this is really good that, you know, coal gets injected into capitalist social relations, into the spiral of MCM prime that you get, you know, the fossil economy and global warming. Um, and climate change, I suppose, in general. So, yeah, I think drawing on Brenner and Wood here was really um, good. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the, the two of us <laughs> would laud somebody for reading Brenner and Wood. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, though, too, because in all of this talk about primitive accumulation, he really makes the point that this, the reason that the fossil capital happened in England is the same reason that the origin, well, it's a bit teleological to say this, that the origin of capitalism happened in England as well. It's because the primitive accumulation of the laborer and of the capitalist was way more advanced in England than it was anywhere else. And so once you got that primitive accumulation in other places and the transition to social relations, then you got uh, this, um, this move to the fossil economy. And he compares it to China, I think, during the Song Dynasty or something like that, like a thousand years ago or something, where he said, this is why you don't get fossil capitalism, or this is why you don't get the fossil economy then, is because there was no, there were no social relations that had been accumulated primitively, um, and you don't have capital social relations. So that's the reason it just doesn't happen, and that it just happened in England. So it's more than just people dunking on England, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I really appreciated his return to... Um... A discussion of that period of Chinese history uh, because and he's sort of criticizing an oft cited argument which says well China was in a, in a similar position to that which England was in during the Elizabethan era um, and it didn't transition into capitalism it didn't transition into fossil capitalism um, in the way that England did and the argument that's often given is a kind of like geological one a one around geological constraints simply that the coal was too far away from the population centers for it to be viable um, and I'm pleased that he pushes back against that idea um, partly by saying that coal use was quite high at that time already so clearly there was access to coal you know people could yeah and he talks about them coal. in China like lugging it a thousand miles to and they do it now they right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and as you say, yeah, he he says a la Brenner that the distinctive feature is the absence of capitalist social relations, not some kind of um, yeah geologic geological or other sort of like given constraint, but something about human beings, not something about the environment. Um, which again is another opportunity for us to return to something that he alluded to at the beginning of this, and then. Um, comes to later on, thankfully for us, because we would have been left um, uh, desperately wanting for it otherwise, which is a discussion of technological determinism and a discussion of, and a criticism of G.A. Cohen, but more broadly, uh, technological determinist views of the development of history, um, ones which put the productive relations as a determinant over the social relations. Um, and obviously he comes at this from the other angle of saying, no, what you had was the social relations first, and then the um, productive relations develop afterwards. And we heard this last week when we were discussing the early sections of this book, right? Like, um, you sort of have um, already capitalist operations in cotton production utilizing exclusively water-powered wheels to generate electricity and then only when it comes up against various social constraints around the disciplining of labor um 
that they then start to make this shift to actually something which is more um, uh, expensive to do initially, but has other payoffs and other benefits. And so it's then you get the technological development um, once you have specific social relations in place. And there are drivers for that development stemming from the social relations, not stemming some from some kind of like objective scientific assessment of um, what is good and what is bad kind of thing. G.A. Cohen has done more to advance Marxist research in the last 40 years than anyone, because in every single book, people just dunk on him. And go, <laughs> I developed my theories because of him, but because he was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should actually read some G.A. Cohen. Yeah, he's, again, he keeps getting dunked on. We keep saying that, but yeah, yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. And all of this is just, it's the Marx quote, right? It's uh, certain specific, historically specific social relations appear as inherent qualities of natural objects, right? And I'd actually like to see someone do a study of the different schools of thought that have their specific object, right? Their specific object that is the thing that ushered us into capitalism, whether it's like coal, as he's talking about, some people think about here, or the water wheel, you know, it's just like, which productive uh, force thing was the thing that got us to where we're going. Um, but yeah, that's always wise to to think of, because obviously, productive forces play a role in it. I mean, this whole book is about how productive forces play a role in it. But the thing is, is that, again, everywhere, you saw people using coal for 1000s and 1000s of years, but it wasn't until it was plugged into the circuit that you got things to change. And one of the interesting examples of that, too, is church property, right? Marx, at the end of Capital and his primitive accumulation stuff, talks about four different methods of primitive accumulation that happened um, uh, to basically free up land. And one of them is, as we've discussed before, um, the breakdown of church property, right? Um, and this is, in England, this is really easy to study because it's the breakup of the monasteries and all of this stuff. But it's really interesting the way that Malm here talks about... Um, coal mining that took place in churches or not in churches, but you know, on church land or whatever by church schmucks. I don't know who was doing it. If it was monks or if it was other people, but um, he was basically doing it. They were doing it to truck and barter, right? They mined coal to burn some for themselves and then just kind of trade it a little bit. But it wasn't until it was actually produced, you know, for capital to accumulate capital. Um, and, you know, for that to happen, you need to have these very specific social relations that we get the fossil economy, but yeah, man, that wouldn't have, I wouldn't wanted that to be my job in the monastery. No. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, you'll be the gardener. You'll be the person that sings the hymns and jack, the mead. You'll mine coal. <laughs> yeah, the mead guy. I want to be the mead guy. It's funny to think it's well, it's interesting to also think back to um, how Perry Anderson discusses the monasteries and the significance of uh, the churches to feudal social relations. He says that they're the most productive in some ways because they own the most land, but also I think they have the most disciplined labor um, and sort of like put that labor to the most succinct use on the larger scales. And then they're able to engage in some of the biggest sort of like uh, industrial projects of feudalism. Um, And to get to this point now where um, the feudal social relations that are still governing, governing how the monasteries operate are now a fetter of sorts against the development or the further development of um, capitalist social relations and the requirement to free up those commodities on the land, but also in this case under it, because he's talking about how coal becomes a commodity, right? Because he says, well, um, for the cotton capitalist to buy coal, there has to be somebody that's already mining it under terms of capitalist um social relations with the profit motive in mind and something has to have changed for that to happen and as you say sort of he talks about um a particular act of parliament in the 17th century which um sort of like um frees up commodities under the land from being something which are the preserve of the crown and allow them to belong to the people who own the land and then therefore allow for um land to become a commodity, uh, which people might want to exploit, exploit for the production of coal, for to then itself function as a commodity in the circulation of capitalism. Yeah, there's all, there's a guy honking outside, so apologies if it <laughs> what he's doing. He's, yeah, he's just I realized the, the other day somebody pointed out to me. Um, well, I know I realized after I was part of a discussion about the honking of horns in cars, <laughs> that, like people don't do that here. 
Really? Like, yeah, I've wow. not I've not heard a single person honk the horn in their car in Cornwall. <laughs> Wow, how nice. How <laughs> nice it must be to not live on a really loud I don't know, bar. maybe it's just really more uh, parochial and provincial and uh, people aren't trying to get anywhere and they're not really, I don't know. <laughs> or it, they do, but they ju- they have the old-timey horn. They go, yeah. Ooh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will listen out for that. <laughs> <laughs> what was the like industry of choice in Cornwall back in the day? Was it just farming? Was it fishing? Mining? Uh, Why well, is tin? Tin. Tin mining, presumably. Okay. And I presumably, maybe there were other um, metals as well. There were probably coal mines here, hmm. probably fishing, hmm. um, and other sort of like um, ancillary work associated with trade, right? Because like, smuggling. you've got some of the last smuggling, I would imagine. Yeah, if we're going to discuss that as a le- legitimate <laughs> trade. <laughs> There's definitely some smugglers down here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, um, all right, well, do we have anything else on the... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to think of, like, there are quite significant, like, emigre Cornish populations all over the world um, <laughs> because they were, uh, were at one point considered to be, like, the world's most skilled miners. And so there's quite a lot of people went to other parts of the world to mine. So it was, it was their their short stature and their ability to see in the dark. And their little mole <laughs> hands that led them to that. Yeah, something like that. You're, yeah. descri- you're describing the way you're describing Cornwall makes me want it. Wow. Sounds cool. It's, it sounds it sounds a bit like the Shire, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Yeah. <laughs> Once yeah, they're great at they're great at mining mining. You just have to let them have their second breakfast otherwise. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Um, plenty of well, do, do we have anything else to say on the uh, Brenner Wood stuff? Um, no, only what I wanted to do was sort of like draw a line from that to perhaps his discussion of uh, the Anthropocene mm. um, because what he's pointing out in a lot of the arguments around the Anthropocene which is evident but it's worth pointing out I suppose is that um, obviously what it does is apologises for or neglects an analysis of how central capitalism is to this process of the destruction of the environment, um, how what's being served really are the interests of capitalists, not the broader interests of human beings, um, but how arguments around the Anthropocene quite often, as you were saying before about like uh, species, populations, human beings, propensity to, what do you to say, breed? breed. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's some kind of natural propensity for us to overcome our environment. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff in the Anthropocene argument of like, um, it's uh, natural to human beings that they would uh, be destructive of the environment in which they exist. Um, Similar to the argument that um, the propensity to truck barter and exchange is something which is uh, natural to human beings. What a, what a miserable view of humanity this like liberal <laughs> school has. It's like people are just going around ripping each other off and destroying the environment. That's what we do. <laughs> but he, I don't know. He does, that, that's all you see, though, now with yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. He does make an interesting point, though, which is kind of like all of these people talking about the Anthropocene probably are quite well-meaning in the sense that they do genuinely want to see um, change to overcome the the threat of catastrophic climate change um and are just sort of falling into some category errors and some theoretical errors um so it's so that which then leads them to perpetuate what is in fact an inherently capitalist ideology um and prevents them from seeing that what we need to do to overcome the climate crisis is to overcome capitalism i suppose yeah it's a first step i guess but it is like if you take it to its logical end, it's like people are the disease, man. And that's just like that's fucking like bourgeois propaganda. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I do have a propensity to breed and to destroy. What a horrible person I am. But he d- yeah, yeah, he does. He, he, do, he does um, very briefly defend the argument, that kind of argument around the out of the scene, saying that the only kind of um, I won't say people because it doesn't really apply, maybe, but. Um, <laughs> The only case in which a theoretical idea of an Anthropocene might be useful is for polar bears or (laughs) some other species that wants to explain why their natural environment is being destroyed. Maybe then, if you could be on the outside of the human race looking in, maybe it would be a useful thing. But um, in his analysis, the human race as it stands is 
irrevocably uh, split in two mm. between uh, the property owning capitalist class and the propertyless proletariat. Um, and it's from that irrevocable split, this split that we need to overcome if we're to overcome the climate crisis. Yeah, that, you just want to show that's... those people a graph, though, of like emissions and be like, why did it just explode? Like, how can you explain that it just exploded, like specifically in the 1830s? You know what I mean? It's like, Cause, there wasn't cause... just like a huge influx of humanity, you because know? Because the genius James Watt <laughs> ah, built the steam yes. engine. Mammon himself. <laughs> <laughs> Or the demon, depending on which the <laughs> which, demon which James you. Watt. I like that. The yeah. demon James Watt. We should start referring to inventors as demons. Demons. Yeah. It's ultra Ludditism. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Prometheanism, but Prometheus was bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that could transfer trans uh, uh, position us into a <laughs> Jesus into a discussion um, that I thought was interesting on his like abstract absolute. Um, distinctions between time and space and about, and this got me to actually understand what the hell he was talking about when he kept saying the flow, the flow, man, it's all about a return to the flow. I was like, all right, well, the flow, what's this? But quickly to talk about like abstract space and abstract and uh, absolute space, I guess. He, he draws a lot on like when he's talking about time and all of this on people like E.P. Thompson and their discussion of time. And he basically says that capitalism has a way to create abstract space and abstract time. And what that is, is if you talk about space first, absolute space is kind of what we saw with the water wheel, right? It's like space is what it is. You know, there's a mountain there and that's a mountain. You use that for mountain things. There's a beach over there. You go surfing, right? Or whatever. Um, and that's kind of how it was with the water wheel. It was like, you can only have water wheel textile mills uh, in absolute space. They exist in absolute space because you had to go to a stream, to a river or whatever, or a reservoir um, to to use them. But this transition to coal and to steam created abstract space where you were suddenly able to discipline the labor movement by just moving your factories wherever you wanted them to. And space no longer mattered at all, right? Space was this abstract thing because you could just bring the prime mover or whatever. You could bring the energy source to wherever you're going. And it's the same thing with time, right? Like listeners of the show will know that Dan and I are still stuck on absolute time because the only way that we know that time has passed is by referencing where our broad beans are at. So that's like, he talks a lot about, you know, pre-capitalist languages, I suppose, is using a lot of absolute time measurements. He says that like English people used to say um, a pissing time, I guess. Never heard that before. I don't know if you still say that, Dan. I've never heard that. <laughs> Sadly, no, that isn't, that's not a phrase that I've come across. <laughs> so if I, maybe we'll have to rehabilitate it. Yeah, know. it's a pissing time. <laughs> yeah. Basically, the amount of time it takes to have a week, right? Um, to take a leak. Uh, whereas now, you know, and E.P. Thompson talks a lot about this as we have abstract time, which is just clocks. It's you split up a day into 24 hours and that's it. You work from nine to five or from whenever to whenever, and that's your time. Time is now this thing that doesn't matter. You know, it's just, it is what it is. And cause we've created it to be what it is. And I don't know, I thought that was interesting because generally I kind of thought about this abstract concrete distinction that you see in Marx as being like abstract is emergence. It's thing, it's, you know, the concrete with emergent qualities, right? You don't get to socially necessary labor time without all of the idiosyncrasies of concrete labor being ironed out, right? So that's kind of what I was thinking about it. So I was like, abstract space, how does it, how does that really make sense? But there is a certain flattening, you know, to the idea of the abstract versus the absolute that I hadn't really thought about too much because it's exactly what he's saying, right? Like you see it in abstract labor. It is, as I've said, that flattening out of the idiosyncrasies of the concrete and that's exactly what capitalism does to time. And it's exactly what it does to space. You no longer have to deal so much with nature about going to where you need to go to the river to have your water mill. You can just have it wherever because the space is abstract, you know? So there's something to that, I think. Yeah. 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 I, I haven't got much more to say on that other than how clearly essential those kind of transitions are to um, the possibility of the full operation of capitalist social relations, I guess, for the functioning of capitalism. Capitalists have to be able to discipline the workers um, in time to create a new type of time which um, is um, conducive to the full exploitation of the labor commodity which they're buying from the workers, you know. Um, and the same, the advantages for capitalism in transition into um, abstract space we covered at length in last week's episode so 
yeah, it's interesting that toward the end of this book, he sort of returns to those ideas when he's talking about some of the impediments of a transition away from fossil fuels and sort of suggests how some of those impediments of the flow um, still exist. You know, some of what, what was overcome with the transition from water power to steam power were the the concrete is that the right word the concrete elements of the space in which the water wheel had to be erected kind of thing um that sort of overcoming and disciplining of nature i guess which is still an impediment now and something that we're going to have to find a way to overcome if it's possible to do so to overcome yeah. the variance in uh, the availability of diff- different types of flow energy uh, solar and wind yeah and he does seem to become he's a solar and wind guy right Mm-hmm. That kind of seems to be what he's like. This, these are going to be the things that we need to do. He's not against. It seems like regional things, like maybe some tidal power, a little bit, you know. But like, really, he seems like it's it's going to be solar and it's going to be wind and it's going to be returned, as he says, the flow, dude. We got to return to the flow. Um, and yeah, I guess that's something obviously to think about in terms of generating enough electricity post capitalism. Because he makes the point, right, like solar energy would be perfect if we had the resources to do that, which actually isn't something that he talks about, really. But um, if we could all use solar, then we'd still have to think about the example he gives is like solar panels of the same size in Arizona would produce way more electricity than they would in Nova Scotia or something like that, right? So the flow uh, taketh and the flow giveth away. Um, yeah, what did, you, what did you make of his... Uh, I don't know, his uh, predictions of the future and or kind of what needs to be done. Um, dire predictions of the future, obviously, because he knows what he's talking about. But also, um, I suppose he leaves room for hope. Yeah, I mean, what he does quite clearly is elaborating from all of the arguments in his book kind of shows how it is that capitalism really isn't well positioned to overcome this kind of crisis. He kind of talks about um, a solution analogous to the full economic mobilization of the Second World War as a potential way out of this, right? You just have to um, uh, form some kind of like uh, ideally continental secretariats that are going to be able to plan for this transition. Uh, Although he has this nice, he has this nice quip later on sort of playing off of the sort of like Jameson it's harder to imagine the end of the world than it's easy to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. It's sort of like under capitalism, it's easier to imagine planning on the grounds of massive geo um, environmental uh, manipulation than it is to simply consider a type of planning that would allow for a transition away from the burning of fossil fuels. Right. Um, And he, he points out that one of the stumbling blocks for, um, a sort of like World War II style mobilization in the face of the climate crisis is that at least when the United States mobilized for war in the early 1940s, it could actually have capital on its side to some respects. Obviously, it had to, the state had to indebt itself and it had to uh, tell companies what to do. But what it wasn't doing is systematically destroying all of the um, capital of those. Uh, uh corporations i guess which is what the fossil fuel what what a transition away from fossil fuels would do because one of the things he points out very well is that there is so much capital fixed capital invested in both the generation of uh electricity at the source i guess like he talks about a lot of the the coal fire fire power stations that came online in the first decade of this century will be in operation for 50 years kind of thing like um and it, it needs that sort of full lifespan for the capitalists to extract the full uh surplus value from them i guess so why so to say okay we have to transition away from coal is a massive destruction of uh their fixed capital and i guess it, it, all of that extends further down the economic chain whereas there are all these industries which are set up to function in a cap in a uh, fossil capital economy and a transition away from that would be entirely detrimental to them, kind of thing. So he definitely rules out that one. Obviously, you sort of you pointed at his um, criticisms of uh, geoengineering, particularly the idea of putting 
what is it sulfur gas into the atmosphere yeah something like just some sulfur <laughs> and you you, you it, it was wonderfully well written where he kind of suggests that it might be a possibility and then in the next paragraph <laughs> as you say on the next page you run through all the detriments whether it's like some kind of addiction to it or like the the destruction of the ozone layer or the reduced We're just poisoning of, humans of poisoning <laughs> human beings hampering photosynthesis and then also and then, and then he gets the real kicker which is like obviously presumably this kind of uh, geoengineering is going to be done so that we don't have to transition off of fossil fuels. So if we're going to mitigate the continued greenhouse effect of all of these gases that are in the atmosphere, both the ones that are already up there, which are con- going to continue to lead to warming, but also the new ones that we're going to put into the atmosphere, we're just going to have to pump more and more and more of um, in, in increasing quantities of this gas into the atmosphere. And um, if there were going to be, if for some reason that effort was hampered at some point, then what you would be faced with is a massive increase in temperature somewhere between three and 15 degrees in a decade (laughs) we did it (laughs) it's literally the futurama the thing that's an inconvenient truth of them being like to solve global warming we dropped an ever increasingly large ice cube in the ocean (laughs) (laughs) and and then he goes through this list of all of these like uh, ghouls as you would say who are in favor of this and it's kind of like your bill gates and whoever yeah and it, oh, to really push him. really push back against the idea that like the the people at fault well what is at fault in the, the climate crisis is human beings in general and not any specific class of human beings no we <laughs> one it's this specific class of human beings and no two we know who they are kind of thing yeah so literally it's all, it's, all, all of, it's all of these <laughs> It's all of these um, fossil capital capitalists who are also the biggest advocates for geoengineer or environmental engineering as the uh, as a solution. Mm. I was I was stunned to remember that Rex Tillerson was the Secretary <laughs> of State. I was like, holy shit, that's right, well, the guy who is in charge of Exxon. <laughs> This book was presumably written before that happened, and um, <laughs> I only know Rex Tillerson's name as the Secretary of State. I'd forgotten that he was, yeah, also head of the. It, I will say though, we may never get the full story of why he was fired to then literally be replaced by the head of the CIA, which is like, oh, <laughs> fucking god. We'll never know the reason why Rex Tillerson was fired. It, people just say it's because he didn't get along with Trump. If it is that he didn't get along with Trump, that is so funny, dude. It's they're like, <laughs> we finally did it. We found the perfect stooge so that we can literally just put the guy from Exxon Mobil as the Secretary of State, <laughs> the guy who's quoted in Fossil Capital as saying my my practice is drilling and i will drill to make as much money as i can until the fucking world burns and then he just gets, <laughs> he gets fired guy, because trump's yeah. an asshole <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that guy couldn't smooth to smooth up to trump enough to, <laughs> to not fall out with him i man being a fly on the wall in those meetings must have just been oh my god it must have been so funny oh my god What are you going to do? I thought the thing when he was talking about the sulfates, the thing that got me the most is he starts talking about how even if you have abstract space, like you don't get a a loss of competition, right? There's still competition between industries and nation states, right? And he talks about like, let's say the United States started doing this whole sulfate thing. He's like, one could see that as immediately ruining all of the precipitation patterns across the globe and say a country like India that relies on its monsoon season just starts shooting these planes down. (laughs) It's like, but honestly, like, I think maybe if we're making predictions, that could be the most likely thing to happen is unless there's just some kind of like, you know. Nobody know. Nobody really predicted how quickly all of this stuff is going to uh, build on each other and just lead to like a big, like, whoa, holy shit, all of a sudden we can't grow food kind of collapse. The thing that I can see happening is just the capitalist finally fucking go, okay, there is something that we need to do. We need to do something. And through the states, they just do something stupid like that. And they just fuck everything up. And it's just like... That's it. That's the best that they can do is destroying the monsoon season for India. Yeah. <laughs> And I think probably the reason why that would be the case is, well, one, it, it's it's minded toward maintaining the status quo, right? But also he points out that it's actually relatively cheap and wouldn't require massive... I mean, obviously, um, uh, it does require some money, but on the on the scale of what would be involved in transitioning off of uh, carbon, this uh, th- that sort of like... That option financially pales in comparison kind of thing. Um I did enjoy the sort of like the line that's drawn away all the way through this book from the efforts 
to unite capitalists around the adoption of water um, in the 19th century as being the potential prime mover and why it failed was because the capitalists basically just couldn't agree amongst themselves they couldn't um, organize and plan that kind of like social engineering they'd much rather have no this is my bit of fixed capital and it's separate from yours um, and then later in these later sections he discusses various instances of various um, agricultural efforts around the world functioning quite well because they don't um, exist under economies guided by capitalist social relations right and he points out that um, it's quite a nice reaffirmation of what we know of um, the requirement for capitalists to operate on a market basically makes it impossible for them to actually organize to plan anything right because they're constantly trying to outcompete one another um, and he sort of leads all the way through to some of the potential fixes that could be plausible, right? Uh, and they sort of like, they're a scaled up version of some of these things that were discussed in the 19th century about making water a viable prime mover for capital. It's um, erecting massive solar arrays and sort of transmitting that power around the world in whatever fashion, or it's uh, storing huge amounts of energy in southern Europe and transmitting it to Norway and using that to pump water into high reservoirs so that when there is a interruption to water and wind, no, uh, solar and wind power in southern Europe, they can then let all this water out of reservoirs and generate it from um, hydrological generators kind of thing. Um, and the stumbling block for him is that the capitalists won't be able to agree won't be they cannot plan on that scale kind of thing and so for yeah. me that's 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 the crux in some ways of what his, what his solution is to this is that you need some kind of post-capitalist form of planning yeah absolutely the thing that's interesting too though about what you're saying is he also says that that kind of anarchy is like uh the anarchy of the market quote unquote mm -hmm. is an inherent quality of coal which i thought was interesting he's like it it, it more than water, it allows for everyone to just do their own thing and whoever has the most capital to, to accumulate wins, right? Um, but yeah, his his uh, his prescriptions for the future were interesting. Go ahead. Oh, well, it's only because coal functions as a commodity in a way that mm. uh, wind or solar don't, right? And like yeah, and one thing, one thing that he doesn't bring up is how this stuff is produced in terms of like, we talked about this very briefly with our interview with Ted Reese, is the way in which you need labor to constantly get coal and oil. And um, unlike once you mine the stuff for the solar panels, just in perpetuity, they'll work for you, right? Like the water wheel was going to work in perpetuity. As long as there was still water, yeah. it was going to work. And it's the same with wind and it's the same with water, right? Yeah. Like there's an element of the actual production of these things that is profitable where the flow, dude, uh, is not because you don't need to produce it after a certain point. It's, yeah. it's renewable. That's the whole point, right? Yeah, there is a point um, in this when he's discussing uh, in the early parts of the 20th century, 21st century, in the first decade of this 20th century, 21st century, which is quite a long time ago now, um, a lot of the fossil fuel companies were thinking of trash transitioning into also having an arm of their corporations that dealt with renewable energies. And there was a lot of um, excited discussion as how, okay, these capitalist firms are going to transition over to being... Um, companies that build and develop solar panels and advance that kind of technology. Um, and then to the later end of that decade, all of those corporations started scu scuttling all of those wings of those companies that were designed to deal with that stuff, basically because it wasn't profitable. And the reason why he says it wasn't profitable is this is almost a sort of like, is a tendential fall in the rate of profit kind of thing. Like the, the, the price of solar panels was falling so rapidly, partly because of um, how China was flooding the market with sort of like um, cheap solar panels that it was able to produce en masse, um, that be by virtue of the fact that um, wind and solar are something which exist out there for free and all you're doing is developing the technology, what you cannot do and what is actually profitable, I think, Mom is saying what is actually actually profitable to these companies is actually monopolizing the supply of the of fossil fuels in this instance monopolizing monopolizing the supply of some kind of cap um, of commodity which you cannot do with uh, solar and wind so it's just sort of talk about that a little bit the nature of that those two types of commodities or well, one commodity and how it differs from something which fundamentally isn't really a commodity in the same way yeah well uh we'll see it's funny like you see a lot of this though, even in modern like Marxist thought, like 
Um, the most recent weekly worker, which by this comes by the time this comes out, might not be the most recent recent weekly worker. The one where the cover article is all about nuclear fission, fusion. What's the most recent one? Fission. One of their big fusion. Fusion. Thank you. Fission breaks apart, and fusion, you know, fuses. <laughs> Don't get your uh, science from us, folks. Um, <laughs> anyways, J Jack Conrad, who we talked about before on the show, excellent, excellent uh, writer for the Weekly Worker, talks about how that ain't never going to happen. Um, that nuclear whatever is never going to be the source. And he was like, this is why um, we need to return to water, or not water, um, solar and wind. And he's like, that's going to be the way moving forward but then he basically says something along the lines of but don't worry about it because there's like a huge trend in the right direction towards companies actually using um, renewables and he is right to a certain extent because you know california has been doing all of this stuff with solar and eventually they're maybe just gonna have to but um at the end of the day like what mom is saying here is there's jevin's paradox right where it's like once you stop using coal it becomes a lot cheaper and they go oh fuck look how cheap coal is right so i think that there might actually be something in the market that uh you know, it's already too late, you know, but that is going to make it so that when it's ultimately too late, um, capitalism would have moved fa fast enough towards solar. So this trust of like, well, all of the patents are owned by Shell and they're all owned by BP beyond petroleum, which I love, <laughs> um, you know, so don't worry about it, dude. It's like, that's like almost Hilferding at its worst because it's just like misunderstanding what they're actually doing. They're just hoarding all of the patents. And for a moment, it might have seemed like it was profitable, but it's not, you know, so. Yeah, 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 we'll see. Yeah, doesn't he? Doesn't he say that what's actually happening is there is a growth in renewable energy, but all that's doing is fulfilling a certain portion of our increasing energy demand, and um, it's not the renewables are not replacing generation of power through fossil oh, yeah. fuels; they're just sort of supplementing it and making a bigger moment. need for energy. Yeah, yeah, Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, really yeah. interesting. Yeah. He was like, when you when you put in one kilowatt hour or whatever of uh, solar into a grid that's ten you're seeing that i don't know how power works it isn't like you suddenly have nine kilowatt hours of coal power and one kilowatt hour of solar power he's saying no the studies have actually shown that you just have 11 kilowatt hours of power production and one of those added on top of that is solar right so yeah. Yeah, good stuff. He seems to be pretty much like we're going actually towards four degrees of warming, which like each thing that we've read has been like more and more getting bigger and bigger. And this he's just like, if things keep going the way they're going by 2050, it's going to be four degrees, which is like, oh, my fuck. Yeah. Well, what was really depressing about this book is that like it was written in what, 2014 or 2015. Yeah. And we're already passing some of these dates that he's talking about some of these predictions being, you know, maybe by 2020, if we can, there's a point where it's like there are some of the optimistic versions are if we fully adopt um, renewable energies now we can start reducing our emissions from 2020 <laughs> onwards <laughs> yeah this is the thing man this is like i don't know maybe i am a like go to the hills protracted people civil war right because it's like what the f i don't know dude <laughs> like beyond just being like kind of what i'm doing which is just I'll just help people and I'll do my best because people still need, you know, to be helped and I'll try and orient them towards like a correct uh, view of the world. One that I, you know, believe is Marxist and maybe that'll make a, you know, a, a good help in the world. But like, Jesus fucking Christ, man, at this point, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know what the answer is because for him, it, he falls back on, you need a mass movement to mm. either pressure or take control of the government. Yeah. And he's it's not, like, well, that's what not, everybody says. That's just vague yeah. enough that that's just what everybody says. <laughs> yeah, he's not squeamish, I don't think, about advocating for it potentially being a revolutionary transition. But Oh, sure. Um, but still, as you say, it's all quite rhetorical, really, isn't it? It's not. Um... Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Be, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. God. Um, one thing we didn't talk about at all, which it's too late to talk about now, but we didn't talk about his whole chapter on China, which was very yeah. interesting. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, just to say, he basically takes the um, Schwang line of everything, which is China in no way, even though it's this huge producer of global emissions, it's still using coal for so much of its industrial production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we can all point and laugh and be like, God damn it, China, you're ruining this for everybody. All of that, all of those emissions are basically being imported into America, right? Where all of those commodities are being taken to. But more so than that, again, it's the Schwang line of like, China doesn't sit outside of global capitalist relations or the global capitalist circuit. 
And in fact, it's the place the capital went to, to invest because there was like this insanely large agricultural, you know, well-educated agricultural population ready to be absorbed into capitalism. Um, and that's what restored profitability. And that's what allowed for this primitive accumulation on a new scale, but on a scale he calls like one city in China, maybe Shenzhen or something like that as like the Lancashire, but like on steroids, you know, because it went from being a fishing village to just like, boom, now it's just like, it produces everything for everybody on the planet. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah the, I guess the one thing I'll say about that chapter on China is it's really important in continuing this narrative that he's giving us around an increased burning of fossil fuels in the global economy being something which sort of like comes after um, various types of spatial fix that capitalists implement to overcome their conflict with labor, right? Like labor unions become too powerful in the West in the 70s and 80s. They transition that workforce to China where it's cheaper, as you say, there's this sort of peasant population. But what does that mean? They've got to build all these factories. They've got to build all this infrastructure. They've got to build all this power generation, um, which is then incredibly demanding of power. And so there's this sort of like massive um, uh, investment or um, increased use and burning of fossil fuels to facilitate that capitalist transition to there. And then when the Chinese workers start to get uppity in 2010 <laughs> or whatever, and the the wages start to increase by 10, 30 percent, whatever, um, the capitalist solution is either to invest in machines, which then require an even greater investment in capital, but also an even greater amount of power to then run all of that machinery, or they continue the transition to some other country where they can find cheaper labor, which then necessitates the building of new power plants and new infrastructure and mm. new roads and new fixed capital and new sort of like investment in carbon burning technologies and things. So um, the capitalist economy is just uh, transitioning from one um, development of new fixed carbon burning capital to another part of the world where they're going to build new carbon burning capital kind of thing. So um, yeah, it's an important chapter for the narrative of the book. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and growing off of that too, like he also talks about something that I kind of thought was funny. And he briefly mentions this mm -hmm. about the, sh the, um, he basically made a point where he was like specifically in America, you know, you always hear about like battles between coal miners and cops and stuff like Blair Mountain kind of stuff. Right. Where like, coal miners started to realize, holy shit, we're like this vital bottleneck of the entire capitalist industry, latter half of the 19th century, right? And if, or even like first half of the 20th, and if we strike, uh, our demands will be met instantly because they can't afford even for a second for coal production to be shut down. And at that point, the capitalists just went, right, fuck it, we'll switch to oil. <laughs> it's like a lot less labor is needed to get to get oil out of the ground. It's just like, oh my God, God damn mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's really interesting how he talks about... Um... Uh, how the technology around coal mining actually doesn't change at all for the first like 100 years of fossil capitalism kind of thing. It's people using picks and shovels and maybe dynamite to sort of blow coal out of the ground kind of thing. So coal is there to facilitate this transition to new technologies in the factories and the cotton mills of the cottonopolises kind of thing, but it does, actually doesn't have any resultant effect in um, in coal mining until... I guess the coal miners resist. And then, as you say, then they transition to new technologies or new sources of fossil fuel or what have you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those coal miners probably got like no time during the day to look at the new corn berserkers, dude. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'm glad, I'm glad you're still taking a, a good amount of your time out of your day to look at <laughs> the Games Workshop website and some more hammer miniatures, Jack. <laughs> well, the new, the new world leader is shit, Dad. Of course I am. It's excellent. Um, and the new Warcry box is all corn. What are you going to do? What did um, I see that really excited me? The RBTs. Yes, of course. Yeah, I want some space cops, Jack. Oh my god! I was going to say you're either <laughs> going to get the like evil, sadistic BDSM elves or cops. Like I don't know yeah. which one do I want. <laughs> Maybe neither. Yeah, no. I want me some Arbiters. They're sick. They're Judge Dread with like some Judge Dread, armor. some Judge Dread Games Workshop Judge Dread. Yeah, mm. I'm into. Um, how are we feeling after this? How how you feel about this entire book? I think it was certainly worthwhile to read. Um, Malm, I will say, now that he's kind of gotten most of the criticism that I maybe had in the first chapter out of the way, I still I still would like to have seen a little bit more about how did this spread to other industries. But 
maybe you didn't need it. Maybe it was once it was proved how productive steam was, then it was just kind of bada bing, bada boom. And you had this proletariat that was just, you know, breeding uh, and cities were growing and stuff like this. Then it just made more sense for people to move their industries over to fossil fuel. But um, overall, this is, yeah, this is great. I mean, it's a great history. He is pretty, he's very, very thorough. And um, he, co- he comes out of it, you know, realistic, but not uh, nihilistic, which I think once you've peered into the uh, potential futures of climate change and not gone insane or just mm-hmm. gotten depressed, uh, it's more than I can do. So hmm. impressive, really good book. Yeah, I really enjoyed this book. I particularly enjoyed the second half of it. Um, it, uh, I mean, that's just my interest. It sort of veers away from the hard history and becomes more theoretical and then also more minded toward the present day and more applying to those theories that he's developed to capitalism more broadly. Um, yeah, as, as for the end, like... I used to have this sort of general optimism around overcoming climate change because it felt like the solutions were obvious. And in some ways, the way he presents in this book, the solutions are kind of obvious, right? Um, the transition to solar and wind is the obvious solution. And if we could just plan that kind of infrastructural development, and if we could uh, rally a social movement and we had a government that was willing to actually decimate fossil capital, then we'd be there. And I suppose it just depends um, how optimistic you are for some kind of social revolt slash revolution. Depends on how optimistic you feel in general. <laughs> but it's <laughs> yeah. nice. But also, also this what this book does confirm is um, the the re- really the only way to overcome the climate crisis is to overcome capitalism, which we've talked about before. But this is a nice elaboration of that argument, particularly in the last couple of chapters. So, yeah, yeah, it's well absolutely. worth well worth reading. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the more the more criticism of like, uh, you know, you can't just focus on fossil fuels because obviously there's like a million other things. I think you and I would also talk about like, but as it comes to just ecological destruction, not even just global warming, not even just climate change, like we would probably focus a lot on the problems of, we're facing with agriculture. And of course, fossil fuels play into that with petrochemicals and everything. But um, there's more to it than just overcoming fossil fuels. Um, and I do find Moore's framework more convincing just because it's broader and just because it is this focus on not just the relations of capitalism, but the relations of the entire web of life, right? Um, and change that and you're good forever. Change fossil fuels, shut down a factory, et cetera, et cetera. You're still going to have stuff to deal with. Um, but having said that, like Moore probably wouldn't have written a history this specific and this needed to get written so you know yeah at the end of the day yeah, this, is a, this, is a, this is a history and moore's book is a text a philosoph- philosophical text really mm. um and his, his synthesis between marxist um descriptions of how capitalism functions w- and his synthesis of that with sort of an environmental analysis a broader ontology maybe mm. um it's certainly more expansive and uh yeah also very stimulating so yeah. yeah, read more books. I don't want to, We don't need to pick a side. I don't think. Don't, don't think it really matters. Don't think it really matters. I'm a Burkett guy. I'm just gonna blow up your buddy's <laughs> mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, was that the book? Yeah, I tried to read that book when I was sick. I read it all and just finished it. I was just like, "What the fuck did I just read?" I have no idea what he was talking about. Um, now you've read Capital Jack. You should go back and look at it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we we actually should consider doing going. Well, we're not going to go back and do more <laughs> capital, but consider just for a main episode doing the primitive accumulation stuff because it's really fucking interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But all right. I mean, that's, this is maybe just want to read some Brenner again. That's what it's maybe want to do. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Who's in? Who's like the modern day holding the torch of Brenner? We'll just find them. Have them on the yeah. show. We can talk about yeah. it. <laughs> um, all right. I mean, he's still alive, isn't he, Brenner? He is. Oh, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Well, beyond me, since Wood is not alive, that's all mm, I know. Yeah. Robert Renner can be alive. Oh yeah, fucking actually, might be alive. Every once in a while, he pops up on the back of a book, like um, recommending it, and I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> I just assumed <laughs> that he's dead. I shouldn't do that. Um, oh, I mean, I dear. don't think he might assume either way. So, fine. yeah, he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, all right. All right. Well, uh, we're seeing some upswings in the labor movement, so maybe there is some hope. Um, But we'll see. We'll see Mm -hmm. all of this climate change stuff. Not my cup of tea, if you know what I mean. Um, All right. Well, we'll be back 
soon. Find some land, I think. Yeah. Let's get yeah. some land and get some seeds. Yeah. And just pray that the jet stream doesn't reverse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll be back soon with some more stuff. Um, we'll figure out what that is. And uh, it'll be good. And uh, it'll be great. So, see you for next time, I guess. Thanks, Dan. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> bye bye. The music you heard this episode was Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion. Till next time. Whoa.